Welcome back. You're listening to The Cinema Condition with your host, filmmaker, and creator of the Nerdcore Podcast Network, Raul Alejandro Mendoza. And I am here for another episode with a new film and a new guest. We, I want to thank you all so much for the support on the last episode. Uh, you guys really, uh, what's it called, enjoyed uh, Through a Glass Darkly with our friend of the network and cinephile and filmmaker, Aiden Burns. And the other episodes have been doing well as well. Uh, I've, I've started to put these up on the... Uh, Nerdcore podcast feed. Uh, every Saturday, Sunday, you get an episode before the, you know, an episode from the past. So you know, right now we're up to uh, I don't know how much we're up to, uh, because what's it called? When this episode comes out, it'll be a different number. But as of recording this, I know you guys have already listened to three episodes of this show, and I want to thank the support on there, and I want to thank about the people who are supporting on this new feed as well, because uh, what's it called? Uh, it's, it's tough to start a new feed and get people coming over here. But, you know, if you guys go ahead and leave a rate and review on your podcast app of choice and on Apple Podcasts, it would help us out a lot. But don't worry, you get these episodes on two on two feeds now. But if you want to hear the season finale before, you know, it reaches the main feed, you're going to want to listen on this one for sure. But today we're going to go ahead and be talking about E.T., the Extraterrestrial with our guest, Wesley Boudelier. Wesley Boudelier is a content creator and cinephile himself. He's a huge fan of the cinema, and he chose this movie today. Uh, this is probably one of the most classic 80 films, one of the probably 80s film that you could pick out from the from America, from the U.S. of A. here. And we've got Wesley Boudelier here to join us. How are we doing, Wesley? I'm doing good. Anytime I can uh, convince somebody to talk about E.T. with me for an hour... It's a good day, so I'm very excited. <laughs> and uh, this is our second go around, so it's probably two times we've already been talking about ET. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had some uh, technical difficulties, but we should be good to go now. <laughs> hopefully, man. Hopefully, don't worry about it. We'll be fine. Um, Wesley, uh, you got you were able to catch this one. Uh, Wesley was actually one of the first four or five, I want to say six people that actually pitched the show to, and I was like, oh, hey man, you want to come on this show? I'm kind of making this new show where you know, you talk about film in a deeper manner. We're not really reviewing the movie. We're more like talking its themes and you know, how the film is shot and stuff. We're not really reviewing it and saying if we like the film or not. And you're like, oh yeah. And I said, uh, do you want to do E.T.? I, I, and I already knew which one you wanted to do, right? <laughs> Yeah, you didn't even have to say <laughs> or uh, give me a choice. You were like, okay, so E.T., right? And I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, usually everybody else, I'm like, hey, just let me know which movie you want to do. And you're like, oh, yeah, I want to do this one. I want to do this one. I want to do this one, right? With you, I was like, hey, man, do you want to do E.T.? Because I knew damn, I already knew damn well which one you were going to want to choose. Yeah, it's basically my personality at this point. So <laughs> Yeah, well, you have Always. a big uh, E.T. figure with you at home, right? I'm staring at it right now. It is a life-size ET. The uh, company NECA made one. I don't can't remember when they first made it, but I bought mine last year at a local toy store, and it's it's huge. It's like the exact same size as the one in the movie, and it is sitting in my living room wearing a shirt right now. <laughs> How does your girlfriend not get scared with that thing? <laughs> I had to convince her that it was a good, uh, a good purchase. I think the the scariest part was the price, but <laughs> it has become a welcomed addition to our home. <laughs> yeah, I can just imagine how like your girlfriend just like do like can you get can this thing not be any scarier? <laughs> just... she, she scares me with it. She'll put it places, and I'll I'll open the bathroom door, <laughs> and it's standing there, and I'm like, oh. Shit. <laughs> yeah. Now you got to get like a life-size version of that of Kermit. You know, that that size of Kermit. <laughs> Kermit would be a little smaller, luckily. <laughs> yeah, but we can, you can get him a bigger, in a bigger size. You know, come on. It doesn't have to be an accurate <laughs> size of Kermit, but, you know, a big size like that of Kermit, like, it'd be cool. I'm always down for that. I, uh, I would have a house full of life-size characters if I could, but... Sadly, E.T. is the only one so far. I, I think what you want is to have a Guillermo del Toro's type of house where he's got, like, dioramas and, like, you know, these big, like, you know, statues. It's yes, just, that's, he literally has, I'm pretty sure he has two houses, and one of them is just for, like, his memorabilia in each room. I'm like, that's oh that's the way to do it right there. Yeah, that, that house scares the crap out of me. If I'd be in that house, I'd be really scared. Uh, but... <laughs> 
Yeah, you, uh, what's it called? Before we had technical difficulties, you said that you were looking at the other movies we have we have done, and you're like, "Ooh, am I the normie for choosing ET?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, some of these are a little obscure. Am I like the the basic boy for picking like <laughs> one of the biggest movies? But I don't think there's anybody that's gonna be like, "This is a bad movie." Like, I don't oh, no. see how you can. No, no, I, I was telling you that. I've I've never heard a bad word be said about uh, E.T. It's like, you know, th- this movie is so heartfelt, so wholesome. It's just a feel good movie. I've never heard anybody say a bad thing about E.T. You know, other films in 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 Steven Spielberg's filmography. Sure, I have my thoughts about AI. Right, I, I have a couple of thoughts on other films that he's <laughs> made. Yeah, I I think that the biggest mistake that Steven Sp- that that Stanley Kubrick made was that inviting Kubrick uh, inviting. Uh, Steven Spielberg to that set because I didn't like what what Spielberg did with that movie. I think that movie should have died with Kubrick. That 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 movie should not have been uh, you know made if it wasn't with Kubrick. So you I know. Have, I've never seen AI, but I know I've heard uh, a lot of differing differing opinions about it. Yeah, yeah. So you know I I've never heard a bad thing about this one at all. Yeah, the only the only bad thing I ever hear about this one is people that are like he's creepy. ET is creepy. He scares me. I'm like shut up. Are aliens <laughs> supposed to be cute now? <laughs> I think he's cute, but I can I guess I can understand that. I mean it it, it also depends if you grew up watching it, I guess, and it depends if yeah. you watch the whole thing. He is scary at first, but mm-hmm. <laughs> you got to watch the whole thing and you're like, "Oh, how can that thing be creepy and scary when he's drunk and passed out in the house? <laughs> <laughs> he's hilarious. It's, yeah. I, I, I've watched this film. A, I watched this film like a couple of times when I was young. Uh, I, I love this movie. I, I told you that when I was watching, I was like, wow, I forgot how much I love this movie. Uh, you know, we there was a lot of stuff. Uh, and I think I appreciated this movie a lot more when I watched the uh, when I watched that HBO documentary on Spielberg. Yeah. Mm hmm. Made me appreciate this movie a lot more, but uh, after rewatching it for the show, I was like, "Wow, I I, I forgot how much I like this movie. Uh, it's like so good." Yeah, I feel like a lot of people just remember like the big moments, and there's a lot of things they forget about. Unless you're me and you're obsessed and you're like looking up stuff every day, but like mm-hmm. I think people who haven't seen it in a while, they remember like, "Oh yeah, they fly on the bikes and uh, this happens," but they forget some of the like smaller details, and then you watch it and you're like. Oh dang! This is actually like this holds up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it really does hold up. It's not like most like it, a lot of movies from that era. The era, you know, they, they they hold up, but not the best. You know, hell, even in the nineties, there's a lot of movies that came out in the nineties that are uh, pretty dated, pretty dated a, a lot. Yeah, and there's some you gotta like if you hadn't seen them as a kid and you watch them now, you're like, uh, okay, but. Like if you have nostalgia for him, you like him. But I feel like ET, like even if you if it's your first time seeing it or if it's your eighth time seeing it, like it's it's always good. Mm-hmm. And if I'm correct, this is your favorite movie of all time, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I uh, mm-hmm. every time I think like, oh, maybe I could like knock it down. Well, I never actually think that, but I'm like. <laughs> Is it weird that it's been my number one forever? Like it's never, it's never changed. Like nothing has ever topped it in my book. Yeah, I, I think that that's so. Like for for a while, I said that American History X was my favorite movie of all time, and then you know I realized that Beautiful was my favorite movie of all time, and you know it, it hasn't changed for a while. And I keep watching so many things now. And, you know, I've rewatched Cinema Paradiso so many times, and I'm like, no. This this still can't be beautiful to me. I think be- beautiful still my favorite movie of all time, and it's it's crazy, man. I, I'm glad that that's what uh, E. T. is for you, because you know, yeah. As as cinephiles, we kind of watch a lot of movies, and like every time we kind of watch stuff that really surprises us. Like what's it called? I, I watched Old Boy, and I was like, wow, like dude, I think that just might be like one of my my top ten movies of all time. And then I look at my top ten, I'm like. Nah, I just can't. No, nah, it's like these are too good. Like these are movies that I absolutely hold so dear to my heart that I can. How can I? How? No, I don't think so. I got to give it a more rewatch. And and but you know we're constantly like watching new things that really surprise us. But you know we go back to the movies like E.T. like Beautiful, and we're like, yeah, no, there's no way it can beat that. Yeah, my uh, my top five I think is like always changing, but my top two is consistent. 
<laughs> like it never never changes. Yeah, I, I I just I just started making a, a list on Letterbox for my one hundred like my my favorite films of all time, and like I'm at one hundred twenty seven now. But like nothing changes from like the top. <laughs> I was like the only one that's ranked is number one. Everything else is unranked. I don't care about top tens anymore. I don't care about top. You know, the only ten, top ten list I like to do is the top ten anticipated movies for the year and the top ten at the end of the year. But you know, like as in of all time, like the only thing that's ranked is number one. Everything else is just organized by you know its rating and alphabetized. So, nah, yeah, it's just, I, I just, I, I've given up on that, dude. Like, yeah, number one it's is, impossible. it's impossible. Number one is just, because all, all the movies just mean so much to me. And, like, there's some that, like, on specific days, Cinema Paradiso might hit differently. Or, you know, uh, her might hit a, a bit differently than Cinema Paradiso. And, you know, I'm thinking, like, wow, okay, maybe, maybe this is better than that. And just, you know, I clear my head and I say, you know what? I love all these movies equally. I don't care what their rank is. The only one that matters with rank is beautiful. That's number one, and that's it. Whatever. Yeah, that's. I'm the same way with this one. It's like, okay, I there's other ones I like and I I love, but nothing yeah. nothing's topping this. Yeah, and, and I guess that's why that's why you picked this one, right? Because usually I ask why did you pick uh, ET, but this you didn't pick it. I picked this one for you, and it's just your favorite movie of all time. <laughs> Yeah, it's like one that I still remember. Like the first time I saw it, I was in second grade and my parents were just like, oh, you should see this. And we watched it together. It's probably one of the only movies I remember watching like with both of my parents. And um, yeah, I think I went through like every emotion in our living room. I was like scared and we had to pause it and I was like, I don't want to watch this, turn it off. And then I got super into it. I was laughing and then by the end, of course, like just sobbing, like uncontrollably because you're sad. But uh, yeah, it was crazy. And after that, I was like obsessed. I like checked out Steven Spielberg biographies from the school library all the time. You and dressed up as dressed- him? Mm-hmm. What's that? You dressed up as him on Halloween. I, I that was for a uh, a book report in oh, third wow. grade. <laughs> we had to dress up as somebody and do a book report about a biography. And I was like, okay, Spielberg. I had my vest and my like painted on uh, goatee, and I <laughs> walked in with a fake Oscar, and I was Spielberg for the day. <laughs> yeah, a lot of us wish we were Spielberg for the day, man. How about you? <laughs> man, you no kidding. No kidding. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I guess that leads really well into where we're going to start with this. We need to go ahead and uh, introduce the filmmaker known as Steven Spielberg. Uh, Steven Spielberg was born in December 18, 1946. On December 18, 1946, he's 73 years old right now in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the U.S. of A here. Uh, it's called He Has Been Working Since 59. And that's a really long career. He's a producer, he's a director, he's a screenwriter. He's been really, uh, what's it called? He's been, uh, what's it called? Uh, um, he's been uh, responsible for so many films, but when he, nobody really talks about his producing career, because, like, you know, he would produce Gremlins, uh, what's it called? Uh, I can't, can't remember the other one. Was it Leprechaun? Uh, not Lepre- uh, Back um, to the Future. I'm sorry, Back to the Future, Man in the Black, and, yeah. and, the, and the Transformers movies. You know, like, he, he's a big producer as well. But, you know, he's also been nominated for, uh, he's been nominated for several Oscars. He's won two Academy Awards for Best Director. Um, You know, not a lot of directors have that claim. Um, He, all right, so, you know, he's one of the most, uh, what's it called, successful directors. You know, he's made some of the most uh, acclaimed films, some of the most successful films. You know, the film that we talked about for a bit was, uh, for talking about today was for a bit, the one of the highest grossing films of all time. And, uh, yeah, it was the it was the highest was grossing the, yeah. of all time yeah. until uh, until he knocked out with uh, his own movie. He broke his own record. Yeah, he broke his own record with Jurassic Park. Mm-hmm. So you know his his first short film was Amblin, uh, which would become the name of his production company, Amblin. Uh, he would you know he he doesn't break out until seventy five with the first summer blockbuster, Jaws. And this is really the one that really puts Steven Spielberg on the map because there's a lot of history with Jaws. And I'm pretty sure somebody's going to choose Jaws soon. And we're going to get to talk about that. But, you know, the movie that should not have worked, worked. And Spielberg was really responsible for that. Yeah, that's like that 
marks like a big change in movies and in his career where it's like, oh, okay, this is the guy. Yep. And, you know, it, it was all, you know, he, he really does become one of the pioneers of, uh, of, 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 of new Hollywood cinema. And it would be a really big shift. You know, he'd be inspired by the likes of uh, Akira Kurosawa that, you know, inspired uh, people like Francis Ford Coppola, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, Martin Scorsese, George Lucas, and uh, David Fincher later on as well. You know, he would also make films such as, you know, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, another one, another huge one, uh, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark. He works with that with his friend, uh, George Lucas, uh, you know, E.T., the one we're talking about today, you know, he also makes uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of, uh, Temple of Doom, The Color Purple, Empire of the Sun, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Hook, Jurassic Park, which knocks off this one, right, for being the most, being the highest uh, grossing film of all time. And, you know, he knocks this one out, but also in 93, he makes Schindler's List. Um, the Lost World, Jurassic Park, Amistad, Super Private Ryan, Artificial Intelligence, well, you know, the list goes on and on. And then in 2020 this year, he'll be, He'll be releasing his his remake of West Side Story. Yeah, I don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm excited, but I'm also like, I don't know. I get more excited for like a new original thing, but I'm sure this will be good too. And it's just like he's doing what he wants now, you know. He doesn't have anything left to prove. So if he's in the mood to make a West Side Story movie, then I I don't blame him for wanting to do it. <laughs> Yeah, like, you know, his career has been really odd as of late. Like, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed the post for was it for what it was, but it wasn't like amazing Spielberg. It wasn't like a young Spielberg at work. You know, I, I have not watched Ready Player One, so I really don't have an opinion on that. But there, there's like moments in Ready Player One where you're like, you can like feel what he's going for. Like parts of it feel like some classic, like fun, magical Spielberg, like kids on an adventure against the adults or whatever but then some of it is just weird the whole sequence in the uh with the shining is awesome but overall it's kind of me messy but some of it kind of rules like mark rylance in that movie is really good yeah man i got i gotta watch that movie i i still haven't watched it. i know it's on hbo uh, i gotta watch it soon but you know, the last one that I watched from Spielberg was The Post, and that was like, you know, it was it was all right. It was it was good, but it's just like, you know, it's yeah. I I saw that in theaters, and I I couldn't tell you anything about it. I don't even remember. All I remember is that Meryl <laughs> Streep was really good in that movie. I, she, I don't even remember that. I don't remember anything she did. <laughs> yeah, Tom Hanks was pretty good in it too, but that was it. Like, you know, it's just it's 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 different. It's you know you you don't have Spielberg of the of the of the of, of like the nineties and the eighties. Like, this is a different Spielberg, and I and I hope he he brings something to the table with West Side Story, and I and I believe he will because it really looks like, at least with the casting choices, like it looks like he's actually you know trying to make something different this time. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be good. I mean, I. I love a good movie musical, and I feel like we're headed in that direction. I mean, I say that. I think after Cats didn't do so hot, I think <laughs> some studios are going to be a little, like, freaked out to do musicals now. Yeah. But I I hope that it does well. I mean, when the country is ever, like, in bad times, musicals do pretty well. Like, And it used to be, like, the thing. Like, those were the blockbusters back yeah. in the day where, like, Huge musicals like the oh, of there's music, 150, yeah. 150 dancing girls on the screen like it's amazing and you don't really you don't really get that anymore. Yeah, I know you got Sound of Music singing in the rain. All those huge musicals that were uh, were part of uh, our history, especially during like tough times. And I know right now we're going through tough times, but you know I, I I can't wait to see what he brings to the table. I really like the casting choices. And I'm excited, but uh, we you know. It is definitely something to say that Spielberg isn't. It's, he's at a really awkward part of his uh, filmography right now, and you know, I, I mean, he's he's an incredible. You know, he's mentored so many people. I mean, Kathleen Kennedy. You know, say what you will about her, right? You know, but she's led you know successful movies, made a crap ton I of think, money. Yeah, I think this was her first movie that she produced. I think E.T. was her first, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. So, you know, she, he's, he's not, he's, he's uh, Spielberg has kind of taken also the role of mentoring people. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of that with uh, these new filmmakers coming up. 
Uh, I know that uh, Greta Gerwig talked, showed him, showed, showed him the concept about, you know, what he wanted to do with little women and, you know, showed him like test footage and stuff. And he's like, she, he convinced her to shoot it on film. And he, she owes a lot of what she did, what she did on, on little women to Spielberg. So, yeah, I know a lot of people are really like Spielberg proteges, like JJ Abrams, obviously I would say Taika, Taika Waititi to an extent is kind of inspired by Spielberg. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, what's it called? How, how, how could you not? I mean, one of the most successful, one of the most, uh, what's it called? One of, one of the most famous film directors of all time. I mean, he really is, there's no other filmmaker that can beat himself at the box office than, uh, James Cameron. Yeah. It's interesting that that's how that went. Spielberg topped himself and then James Cameron topped him and then topped him and himself. And now mm-hmm. obviously Avengers, but yeah, um, yeah. It's interesting that him and Cameron both had that happen back to back like that. Yeah, and 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 it's crazy, and it says something about uh your it says something about your uh, your your filmography, uh because you know I, I think that uh, when when the Avengers does it, that's not because of the Russo Bros. I think that's more of like you know brand name and all that stuff, and you know the the the, the Marvel name on it and the characters and stuff. But this is because the these movies top themselves because it's Spielberg, it's it's his work, and you know. It's crazy, and I and I can't wait to start talking about this. We're gonna go ahead and get into it now, uh, if, uh, unless you want to bring up anything else about Spielberg that you know. I'll take that as a no. So, what's it called? Let's go ahead and get ready here. E.T. is a story about a uh, a uh, an alien that you know crashes into Earth, and his people leave him behind, and a little boy named Ali- Alien Alien Alien. Elliot uh, finds him and befriends him and they're trying their hardest to uh, find a way to send him back to his home because he cannot survive on earth and it's a story about family it's a story about you know suburban life but you know deep down it's you know it's a it's a really heartwarming story about a a boy and his alien Uh, you know taken from like the classic stories of a boy and his dog this one's a boy and his alien Um, Wesley are you still there? No, he's not. You got out. All right. Yeah. Hello. Hey, man. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, what's it called? You you couldn't you you stopped talking for a while, but uh, we're still here. I just said that this is the classic boy and his dog story. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Like I think I've heard Spielberg call it that before, where it's like it it that's exactly what it is, mm-hmm. and but like taken to a different like a whole different level. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, and I and I love this. This 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 movie, you know, it, it has a lot of really, really, uh, really touchy moments. He, it's it's funny because there's stuff that's really scary in here that you're thinking like, wow, Spielberg can make a horror movie in this with this with some of this skill that he's putting in here. You also have those moments of really like comedic parts where you're like, oh, wow, like this alien's drunk at the house. And then you have like, you know, the really heartwarming parts where, you know, you're kind of like, oh, it's tear jerky. Yeah, it really like. It changes tones like a lot, but it's also like it fits so well together. It's uh, it's wild. Yeah, there's definitely like some horror elements, like when Elliot first meets ET, and then also mm. uh, when the astronaut hazmat suit guy starts showing up at the house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. When all the uh, astronauts come in, you're like, <sighs> yeah. yeah, that's very like horror movie esque. Yeah. It's kind of terrifying. <laughs> And uh, it was said, it said that uh, Spielberg really, uh, what's it called, made this film, you know, inspired by his own life after his parents' divorce and his imaginary friend that he creates. And, you know, it's really, uh, there's a lot of stuff in here about like, you know, life in the, in the suburbs really isn't what it's out to be. Yeah, you know, it's, and yeah, he talks think, about that uh, on that documentary from with HBO. I think it was, th- this came out of Close Encounters, like they were there were two stories or it it was like one story and then it ended up being two and close encounters is kind of like the other side of the ET coin where it's like, uh, there's suburban dreams, which is ET. And then there's suburban nightmares, which is (laughs) close encounters. Yep. Yep. And uh, what's it called? Uh, This is really shows you the, what's it called? The, The really like, you know, like, 
that suburbia, you know, these kids are out playing by themselves. You know, the family, we don't really know anything about the parents. Like, you know, the kids are out just being knuckleheads by themselves. And you're like, you know, where, where the hell are your parents? Like, the only parents you see here that are caring is like, is Elliot's mom, Elliot and Michael's mom. And the other ones, you like, you never hear anything about them. It really shows like, you know, there's, there isn't really a sense of commodity in, in this neighborhood. It's really, uh, what's it called? Uh, you know, a very secluded area. And, you know, by the end, you, the, the, the camaraderie that's there is between, you know, uh, Elliot, his, his brothers, you know, yeah, his friends help out, but like, you know, there's a really big shift in the relationship between Elliot and Mike. Yeah, that's probably my favorite thing about this is like it brings the siblings so much closer together because you see like at the beginning, there's things I didn't catch as a kid. Like obviously they'd gone through a divorce and uh, the uh, dad has run off with Sally in Mexico and Mm -hmm. uh, Dee Wallace's character is really like heartbroken about it. And Mm -hmm. the family is just kind of like torn apart at the beginning. And then this like crazy adventure brings all of them together in the end and it really uh really just changes everything because like michael and elliot obviously they don't get along at all at the beginning and by the end he kind of becomes like a a protector figure for him instead of like a bully like he is at the beginning yeah yeah and it's it's you know the divorce part is really interesting because you have these kids who are still growing up grudy the one, the, the most prominent one that's barely growing up. I mean, she's a child, you know, but, you know, Elliot is really there at the sweet spot where, like, you know, he, he, he needs a father figure in the house to help him out, you know. It's not to say that a single mom can't do that work, right? You know, but I know thousands of single moms, and, you know, my, my mother was a single mom for a, for a bit uh, with, uh, with my big brother, and, you know, they can definitely do it. But Car- Elliot's character, he, he, wants, he wants a dad. He wants his dad help. You, you really wish he could, you know, talk to his dad and tell him about, you know, E.T. And, you know, he's kind of there having to grow up by himself because his brother is very distant. He's being a bully. And his daughter, his, his sister is kind of a little bit too young to understand what he's going through. Yeah, he's at that that age where you're like, it's probably around the same age that my parents got divorced where it's like, you're just a, you're not impressed by anything. You're kind of like, uh, acting out a little bit and that sort of thing. So it's, it's like, yeah. it's that age where you're just like, no, this sucks. And I'm going to, I'm not afraid to say it. I <laughs> think he's making his mom upset at the dinner table and stuff. And it's like, that's, that's how kids are. It's like, you don't think before you say things, you're just like angry at the world, basically. Yeah, man. And when you don't have your father there, or your mother, and it, you got one parent missing in the house, you're kind of like, wow, like, you know, I, you know, I love my mom, of course, you know, Elliot loves his mom, but, you know, he's like, why don't you go tell your dad? And he's like, oh, you know, he's not here. He's in Mexico with the other woman, you know, like, how am I supposed to talk to him? And, you know, that that moment in the forest when, you know, Elliot tells him, well, you could stay here, E.T., we can grow up together. It's like, ah, oh, that, that one, that part gets to me. And it's like, Man. you know, because he's like, he, he wishes he had the relationship he has with E.T. with his brothers and, and yeah. with his brother and, he, and his sister. He doesn't really have, he doesn't really have a friend no, at he the does, beginning doesn't of this. He doesn't really have a friend what? because his, his, uh, his brother's friend's kind of like, eh, like whatever, he's around, well, yeah, whatever, he's, he's a little brother. Uh, and his brother's obviously the, being, a, being the nast with him at first. And his sister, you know, of course, she's too young. She doesn't understand what's going on. So he finds a friend in this alien. And it's like when this alien wants to go back home, it's like, wow, like, you know, damn. You know, you could stay here. We could be the friends and we can, you know, hang out and you, we can grow up together. Mm. Yeah. But everybody, like, fundamentally changes after the events of this movie. Obviously, we don't know what happens next but like you can tell like this yeah whole experience has changed everybody for the better yeah yeah and you you read it when on their faces it's like you know wow like you know maybe maybe i, my, maybe I should pay attention to my kid more often because apparently you know, <laughs> it was real when he said that there was an alien yeah apparently there was supposed to be uh, a different ending they were going to go back because you know at the beginning they're playing Dungeons and Dragons the the boys and they won't let Elliot play and the idea was going to be that uh, Elliot would now be the dungeon master at the end of the movie (laughs) and uh, it would be like oh wow he went from not being allowed to play now he's the dungeon master but then it's like 
they didn't end up doing it because it's like, how do you top that ending? Like, it would just, anything else would be like, it would just pale in comparison. Like, that's such a epic ending, like a crazy closing. And it's like, you got to end it there. Like, you can't top that. Yeah, man. And I, I think that that's a really, I think that ending really speaks really well off and really it kind of shows that relationship between uh, Elliot and E.T. And uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and get into a commercial break in a bit. But, uh, we've, you know, we got to get in there because, you know, we're already halfway through. And, uh, yeah, just stay tuned, guys. And when we come back from commercial break, we'll keep this, uh, talk, we'll keep on, uh, <laughs> sorry, guys, I'm missing out on my, uh, what's it called, words here. When you come back, we'll finish our conversation on E.T., the extraterrestrial. So uh, just listen to these commercials, and we'll be back in a bit. Hey, I'm Raul Alejandro Mendoza, and this is... Jabril Newton. And we are the hosts of High Flyer Radio. Radio. And finally, pro wrestling has come back to the NerdCore podcast feed in the form of a show hosted by Jabril and I. And we talk about everything and anything in the pro wrestling world on Mondays at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Nothing's off limits. Whatever you guys want to talk about, it is from AEW to SmackDown to Raw to NXT. Nothing's off the table. We can talk about it. We're going to talk all about it. And if you can get it a day early, you should go to the www.patreon.com slash the nerdcore and pledge to the tiers on there so you can get this show and a lot of shows days early before anybody else gets to hear it. But enough talking about it. We'll go ahead and see you there at the Square Circle. Oh, yeah. Don't tap out. Tune in. Tune in. Hey, it's Ashley from the Gamer Core. You may remember me from such episodes as Big Screen Mess, Mo Money Mo Platforms, and Brad Can Read. Tune in weekly as I blab with my co-hosts Raul the Nerdy Chicano and Brad the Random Germ about the latest news in gaming and gush over what we're playing at the moment. Oh yeah, and we got the deals too. Keep up with the latest deals in gaming and what's happening as I mediate Brad and Raul fighting like a married couple. Will Death Stranding ever come out? Will Cyberpunk 2077 live up to the hype? Is a next-gen worth a $500 console price tag? And has there ever been a movie adaptation of a video game that's been done right? It's all on the Gamer Core podcast, everywhere where podcasts are. Hey everyone, my name is Raul Dinari Chicano, and I am the host of The Impert Files. The Impert Files is an interview show brought to you every Thursday on the Nerdcore podcast feed. And... I interview people such as filmmakers, content creators on YouTube, and podcasters like Colton Geschwander. And if you want to listen to that early, a whole week early, all you got to do is go to the Patreon and pledge to the $1 tier. And if you want to listen to it with the general public, then go to the Nerdcore podcast feed on anchor.fm slash the Nerdcore. And the case is close, but it's not classified. See you guys there. Hey guys, this is Brad, aka Young Yoda. Raul said I had to make an ad, so that's what I'm doing. Um, it's supposed to be for Unstructured, but as you guys know, you can freaking catch me everywhere when it comes to this podcast feed. You can find me on the Nerd Cores, on Gamer Cores, on Nerdy Chicano sometimes when I get lost. Uh, I mean, but for this particular one, I want you guys to go check out Unstructured. The Raul gave me free reign to do whatever I want to do. I don't know what he was thinking. So go hear me talk about LeBron James and Taco Tuesday, vaping, uh, so many other freaking weird topics that uh, chimichangas, that's a good one. Uh, shout out to Deadpool. And yeah, I, I guess this is the end of the ad. So if you guys want to find me, you can find me all over the place on this uh, podcast feed. Anyways, thank you guys for listening. I love you all. And nerd up. Hello, 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 guys and gals, and you're listening to The Ladies of Nerdcore. I am your host, Daniela Nunez, and along with my amazing co-host, Ashley Garcia, we discuss many things like social impact, pop culture, political realms, and any controversy surrounding the nerdverse. Tune in and listen to us bi-weekly on the Nerdcore podcast feed, and we will love to chat and hear your thoughts on our wonderful show. And thank you again for listening to The Ladies of Nerdcore. What's up, everybody? It is me, Raul, and I'm one of the hosts of the Nerdy Chicano Show. The Nerdy Chicano Show is a comedic show brought to you by Luis and myself, and it comes to you all every Sunday on the Nerdcore podcast feed. You can catch it a day early by becoming a Patreon and supporting us at the $1 tier. And I don't really know how to explain this show other than it's fun. 
we get to talk about whatever we want and it helps you move on in the week. So if you want to catch on, if you want to catch the the Nerdy Chicano show every Sunday on, at 8 a.m., all you got to do is go to anchor.fm slash the nerdcore and we'll see you there, baby. Hey everyone, I'm Raul. And I'm Brad. And we're the hosts of the Nerdcore podcast, the podcast that talks that nerd. Shh, not on this ad, right? Not and. On this one. We come to you every Monday, Tuesday, and Saturday. On the Mondays, we talk the news. That's the box office, the news of the week, and your trailer talk, if there is any. And on Tuesday, we have our theme review. And on Saturday, you have a Saturday morning review, usually movies that have come out in the week, or anything we want to talk about. Right, Brett? Exactly. Whatever we want to talk about, this is our show. If you don't like it, then you don't have to listen. We're the flagship show of the Nerdcore Podcast feed, and we can be found everywhere you can listen to podcasts like Stitcher, Apple Podcasts. So if you want to talk that nerd stuff with us every Monday, Tuesday, and Saturday, make sure you tune in. And Brad? Young Yoda out. We're back here on the Cinema Condition, and we're still going to be discussing E.T., Extraterrestri- the Extraterrestrial, with our guest, Wesley Buderlier. I'm sorry, I got a, got a burp right there. Wow. Ugh. <laughs> and, uh, it's not like E.T. when he gets drunk. <laughs> Just an alien getting drunk on in the day in daylight. Not even <laughs> caring what the suburban moms are gonna say. Yeah. yeah getting, getting drunk and watching Sesame Street. Yep. Yep. Or watching uh, what's it called? Tom and Jerry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. It's basically it's all... life right now in quarantine, getting drunk and watching Sesame Street. <laughs> yeah, this, this is about to create so many alcoholics, man. Like, you know, <laughs> this is Honestly, oh, <laughs> this is crazy. This guy getting drunk in the morning, watching Sesame Street, and uh, talking about the Muppets. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite the life that ET lives, and it's not even quarantine times at that time. Yeah, uh, but anyway, yeah, we're here to continue our talk with uh, our, with our guest Wesley Budalier about ET, the extraterrestrial. And uh, when we left off, we were talking about, you know, that ending. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I say that, what's it called? I really like how that ends and just uh, the, the whole relationship between E.T. And, 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 and Elliot's so, you know, symbi- uh, you know symbiotic. You know, it's, it's so, it's back and forth. I mean, there's just E.T. Come on, the first letter of Elliot is E. The last letter of Elliot is T. It's E.T. Elliot is just as much as part of E.T. that E.T. is part of him. Yeah, I think that's what really, like, makes it special, too. There's so many movies where, like, a kid befriends a creature of some sort, but a lot of times it's, like, goofy and it's played for laughs and it's, like, I don't know. There's a lot of, like, bad movies where, like, a kid meets a CGI character or something, but this is, like, no other movie has done it like this, I feel like. And the fact that they're, like, connected the way they are, they, like, feel each other's feelings is such a, like a wild concept. Like there's a lot of high concept stuff in here for a, a family movie. Yeah. That I think a lot of people take for granted. You don't think about it like, like, Oh, this is wild that this is in this movie. <laughs> yeah, dude. And, um, uh, what's it called? Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a really high concept film and what's it called? Th- those effects, they still hold up. Uh, very, Man. very much. So many years later, they're very, very good effects. Uh, you know, it's you know, it's good when they try to like go in because I know they did like the 2002 re-release and they tried to like add CGI and like improve a bunch of stuff. And everyone was like, "No, nah, t- bring back the regular stuff," because <laughs> those practical effects are just like insane. Yeah, those those practical effects are incredible. I mean, Spielberg is no what's it called a uh, stranger to practical effects. I mean, look at Jurassic Park; you, that was practical effects, and it's crazy how great that is. And, and it's surprising that he wanted anything to do with it after like Jaws was such a pain in the ass as far as like dealing with that mm-hmm. uh, mechanical shark. But like, <laughs> man, they they went all in with the the ET stuff. Like, you should uh, look up Carlo Rambaldi who did the. Uh, we like designed ET because he's amazing. They won the Oscar for uh, for that as well, and uh, just the amount of work that went into that, like the design process, and then obviously like making the animatronics and the costumes, because it's it's like three different people who had to be in the uh, in the costume at different uh, different moments in the film, like depending on what they were shooting, and like 
the, the amount of people it takes to bring this one character to life is mind boggling. Yeah. And, and, and it works because you really do feel like this is a, is an alien with feelings. You, you really feel it. And it's a lot of that is because of the people who are operating the, the, the machine, but also the people who are doing the voice of the machine and, you know, just, just those moments where everything kind of seems to be working really well together to make yeah. for this uh, creature who you can feel what he's feeling at times. Plus, just like having having that on the set, I think just makes all the difference. Like nowadays, it's like, oh, okay, we'll do it all in post, we'll animate it, whatever. And it's like it's so much. You get you get something else entirely when actors can actually like interact with something. Like ET is there on the set. You're not just like talking to a tennis ball and some dots you're know, like yeah actually sitting there and watching all of this happen like oh his neck comes up okay well we'll do it right here like it's <laughs> it's kind of incredible because yeah just doesn't doesn't happen anymore like i can't remember the last movie that really had like some insane practical effects like that they just they don't take the time to do it anymore yeah no it's it's definitely not like that anymore and it's very uh what's it called a uh, very heavily based on digital effects and you know there's some good digital effects but there's just something about you know going back to practical and not having to talk into tennis balls with dots and you know having your your scene look the way it looks because of you know it's practical effects and uh you know i i i i'm constantly seeing people like you know put stills of movies like you know they're really cgi and it's like well look at this and it's like look how amazing this looks i mean but like take a frame here from ET where it's just practical effects and you know, it's, it's very special what you're watching. You know, it, it feels yeah. like it's a boy and an alien just having an adventure. Yeah. It's a, uh, you can still get good stuff with CGI and everything, but it's like, it's just, it's just so different. Like, I don't know. They, they went through a lot of different things to really get the emotion out of there. I think my favorite movies are always where they like, have kids go through something like uh they shot they shot this entire movie in sequence and i think that really helped yeah. like with the emotion especially with the kids and it's like any movie that like puts kids through the ringer like that like uh the original willy wonka where it's like oh let's just like scare these kids <laughs> and get like genuine <laughs> reactions it's like it always turns out good that sounds bad but it's <laughs> yeah it always it always turns out good so they like they really like took the time and the effort and it's like back then you you had to you had to like like go roundabout ways to figure out like okay how can we do this how can we make this look real and look good and they did like et walking that's a uh i don't know if you knew this that's there was a kid who was i can't remember if he was born without legs but there was a kid who doesn't have legs and he would walk on his hands and he's in the et suit and that's how et is like walking like drunk and stuff it's a kid walking on his hands in the suit it's kind of incredible like who who would have thought that like who would have thought to even <laughs> like come up with that yeah no I, I i get what you're talking about man and it's a, it's really special and you really do you know really believe those moments when they're together and they're feeling mm -hmm. like you know like like this this is a real friendship and it really shows off with uh with the carrot with the actor and the and the animatronic uh you know you, it's a the, the whole sequence thing is really interesting where they're, you know they're, they're kind of filming it chronologically and you really uh what's it called to have that relationship between michael and elliot really feel like it's believable like if it's changing and uh you know that what he learns from Michael changing is what he kind of brings on to Grudy now, and 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 it all feels like everybody's kind of changing for the better. Yeah, yeah, and I I love the child actor performances in this. It's like every every performance in this really, but like these are my favorite child actor performances ever. And I know some people at the time were like Henry Thomas deserves an Oscar nomination, and I'm I'm sad it didn't happen because he's. He's phenomenal in this movie. One hundred percent, man. He's he's incredible. Uh, all, everybody who's in this in this one is uh is is, is doing really well with the acting. Uh, yeah, because it it doesn't it doesn't work if the kids aren't good, you know. And there's 
there's plenty of crappy child performances out there in other movies where it's like, oh, this kid is annoying. And it's like, if you cast the wrong kid, it completely falls apart. But like everybody in this movie is just like on fire. It's just like nothing but home runs the whole time. Yeah. And what's it called? One of my favorite, one of my favorite parts about this movie is when, uh, what's it called? <laughs> when he's, when he, when he comes home and, then, and you know, he's, he's obviously drunk. What's it called? My, Elliot's drunk or what's it called? He's feeling like hang hung over because of, because he's, because he's feeling what E.T.'s feeling, right? And E.T. just pretty much went through a whole six pack and <laughs> he, he looks like E.T. dressed as a girl and he goes, Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a, such a good reaction. He's like, "Are you serious? Like, come on, man! Why? Why'd you do that to my to my alien? Like, it's you didn't even want to. You were scared of him at first, and now you're over here giving him a makeover. <laughs> that uh, oh, they're they're all so good in that. And then Drew Barrymore apparently really thought he was real. So, oh wow, that's, that's amazing. It's pretty funny. I saw a clip yesterday actually of uh, they were. It was uh, them in the bedroom, I think, when she first meets E.T. And she's talking to Henry Thomas. And she's he's uh, convincing her that he's real. He says something. He's like, you know he's real, right? And she was like, well, what are those wires? And he's like, that's his feet. You didn't know that? And she's like, but and then you hear Spielberg go, Drew, honey, can you get back in your spot, please? <laughs> it's so, so good. That's so bad of him, man. Come on. <laughs> I think she already thought he was real on top of that, but it's like I wonder at what point she was like, Oh, this is <laughs> like did she just go her whole life like, hmm, I wonder what ET's up to now. <laughs> like, well well that really helps with the performance because you really do feel like, wow, this this little girl really does think that this is a real alien. Like, you know? Yeah, it is a real alien, apparently. of course, in the movie, but you know, it's like, wow, like I could believe that a little girl like you would have a relationship like this with a little alien. <laughs> Apparently she introduced her mom, like her real life mom on set to the animatronic, but nobody was working him at the time. And she was like, oh, he's shy right now. He doesn't want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's like, just great. Like, is there a cuter, more adorable child yeah. that has ever lived i don't think so it's yeah like i mean that's every- that's where the whole part of like innocence comes into this movie with with her like of course you have you have like michael who is the uh the teenager growing up and he wants to be his own you know, kind of be an independent person you have the uh, little boy who you know you have elliot the little boy who just really really wants a friend and really wants a what's it called a what's it called a he understands how the world is at the moment and he realizes it's crap and then you have the innocent child in in Rudy who, you know, it's like, wow, like there's an alien in my room. That's cool. Like, <laughs> wow, it's scary, but it comes becomes cool. Kind of want to become his friend. It's 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 really interesting because you have all these different perspectives coming from uh, coming from different parts of the family. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, I love uh, if we want to talk about like specific scenes, I love all the Halloween stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that first part when they go off in the with the bike, and he's like, "Wait, wait, wait, wait. no, don't stop!" I'm like, "No, oh God!" And he's like, "Please don't crash! Please don't crash!" I also forgot just how epic that whole uh, that whole chase scene is at the end when they're trying to get to the forest, and Michael and all his friends are on the bikes, and it's like crazy BMX stunts. Because after after this movie, like everybody wanted to do like BMX stuff, <laughs> like was the coolest thing ever because of this movie. <laughs> so this is the movie that starts that damn obsession. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's that, that seems really well shot and I really like it. Like, Oh, they think they just, they, they have them. They, they think that the, the, the police like, Oh, we, we've got them. We're done. We got them. We're at the end of the hill and then boom. No, it doesn't happen. No, you gotta, you gotta go keep chasing them. I, I love that. Those and that BMX stuff was so popular after this too, because of, like the crazy bike stuff in this movie. Yeah. Uh, so you can thank Spielberg for, uh, for pretty much inventing the sport of BMX, the extreme sport of BMX. Um, yeah. I found a cool article too about, uh, I, I think if you just look up like ET, the extraterrestrial, like BMX boys or something, you could probably <laughs> find this article online about the kids who did like the, the stunt work for the, uh, all the bike riding stuff. 
That's pretty interesting. Yeah. I wonder how many of those actually became BMX riders. I think some of them already were because I, I was reading, I was uh, listening to this thing about it and uh, the guy who supplied the bikes was like, I think this is going to be like a big deal. And he like just brought somebody with him that worked in his shop to like bring the bikes over to the set and uh, Spielberg saw how this kid was riding and they were like, okay, let's like get some more of your friends and like come be in the movie and do the yeah. stones. <laughs> and they did. Yeah, that's, that's so cool, man. Uh, one of the last things I want to talk about here before we know, this is the last thing, the last thing I want to topic I want to talk about before we actually have to finish up here and we have to do all that uh, wonderful stuff we do at the end. Uh, I want to talk about suburbia, man. Really, the whole life in suburbia that it's being portrayed in here. So, uh, for like people who don't understand, uh, you know, one of my one of the things that I could probably see people complain about this movie is like, wow, like you know, this this neighborhood pretty much uh, pretty di- pretty not diverse. And it's like, oh, you know, it's it's interesting because you know, the the the, the white population really moves out to the suburbs. Uh, after uh, minorities really start uh, becoming a really big prominence inside the uh, the, the city, the inner city, and uh, a thing called white flight starts happening, where all those white families start to really move out to the suburbs, and they start to cultivate uh, what's it called a, a more dominant uh, Anglo uh, population out in the suburbs, and in here you see that you know pretty much it's a pretty popular uh, white populated uh, town, a white populated suburb, and it's it's interesting because you see like all these families. You know these kids riding riding alone at, at at night. They're outside, no supervision from adults, and you're like, wow, like you know, like life in the suburbs. This the suburb seems to be really different than uh, most suburbs you see in film. You know, a lot of them's like, oh, look at the beautiful patios, the beautiful yards. Look at all these people being so nice to each other and really making it seem like okay, maybe life in the suburbs really isn't that lonely. But here, it really does make it look like, wow, these kids are really on their own. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that Spielberg is doing something really interesting with there because he's kind of like, you know, like even these kids who are probably like the really well off families, you know, this kid who doesn't have a father, he still feels kind of lonely and sad. And he could be out here in like one of the richest neighborhoods and he's like still going through something and. It, 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 it really interesting because you're like, usually suburbia isn't shown like that. It's supposed to be like this really nice place, really secluded, where everybody kind of gets along with each other. And that's not the case here. Yeah, you never really see him interact with anybody. Like, he really doesn't have anybody that he confides in or of any friends at school or anything. And I think maybe there was originally supposed to be like a, he was supposed to have some kind of friend, but I think it just it works better this way where it's mm-hmm. like he's he's really like coming into his own throughout this movie and uh yeah it's all because of meeting this thing like the ultimate friend that you can possibly yeah. have so and, so. and i like that you know because apparently Steve spielberg was like yeah i can this kind of shows me because i was the loner at that time you know, i was a kid who didn't have many friends in school and it's like, wow, like, you know, it really shows there that this kid is really alone. This kid really feels alone and E.T. is his only friend and it's really understandable that he wants him to stay with him. And it, it goes to show that, like, you know, this 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 glamorized neighborhood that is seen, it's, it's, it's told to be, like, one of the best ways to live. It's like, you know, take your kids out to the suburbs. Like, you know, you, you there's not that much crime. There's, like, it's kind of secluded. Like, everything is supposed to be tip-top in shape. It's, it's, it doesn't seem to be that. These kids are very much growing up differently than than people think because suburbia isn't usually highlighted like this. Yeah, yeah, and I and I really I think that that's one of the really big interesting parts about this movie is just you know the, the relationship between the kids and at the end of course you know the the the, the friends help out uh, Henry Henry why did I say Henry um, they help out <laughs> Elliot uh, I was I was thinking about the dog Harvey. I was like, wow. <laughs> I, <laughs> I love him. Hell, even the dog had a relationship with the with the with ET. Is like at first he was barking at him, and then uh, what's it called when they're when he's there getting drunk? He's like, ah, you know what? This guy's kind of like my friend too. And he, yeah, and he tries to get on the spaceship at the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. He does try to get in. I kept laughing. I, I kept wondering, like, wait, y'all just let the dog get out of the house like that? And he went with you guys all the way to the to the. Uh, to the to the forest, like crap, dude. Like, you, did you guys never notice that the dog went with y'all? <laughs> yeah, 
I like uh, the relationship with the. I don't know if they ever refer to him as Keys in the movie, but I know that's how he's credited. The uh, the one like main scientist who kind of talks to Elliot, and it's he's kind of like Elliot grown up, like adult Elliot, or that's how he kind of like portrays himself. But uh, it's interesting because you don't really see any other adults besides uh, Mary, the mom, until like the last third of the movie, maybe. Yeah, yeah, the, and uh, the mom is kind of really like, you know, in her own world, you know, she's like, obviously she's going through the things about her divorce, and what's it called, She she's sad, and she's like, kind of like, not all there until the, finally the kids finally show the the, the, doc, the the doc, the alien to him, and it's like, to her, and it's like, wow, like, oh crap, like, you guys weren't lying, like, wow. Uh, That's one of my favorite, my favorite bits is her being just oblivious to him, like, <laughs> every time you think she's about to catch on, and yeah, everything you t- every, every, you think he's about to catch on, he's like, oh, no, 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 there you go. It's like, oh, like, Groody just wants to show you the damn alien. Just turn around. He's like, you're going to finally see it. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. And every time, too, like, I've seen the movie so many times, and even now I'm like, oh, shit, she's going to see him. <laughs> and then when she finally does, it's like she's the one person who, like, the first time she sees him, it's, like, horrific. Like, him and Elliot are, like, sickly and, like, di- literally dying and, like, that's such a such a shift change, such a like different tone than when everyone else beats him. It's like yeah, it's kind of incredible. Yeah, and and, and Spielberg does an incredible job of making this really timeless. This feels like this this film is really. Uh, I mean, you're if you're a, you're a kid growing up, you're gonna feel this, and it's only one of the best uh, coming of age films, and it's a really one that you know it kind of sticks out to everybody. And yeah, this is like my. Uh, my go-to of like anybody who's like, Oh, I want my kids to watch something. That's not like the same thing over and over. And it, like, you know, some kids, they want to watch the same like frozen over and over, but like people who want to introduce their kids to like film or just like what movies can be like, this is the one I recommend to anybody who's trying to get their kid to see some like classic movies. Like this is such a good one to start with. Yeah, and it's it's really one that uh kind of especially for those who like you know outcast kids that this one kind of makes them feel like oh wow like you know like you know maybe maybe we're maybe we're not like alone in all this and really kind of feel like you know like everything's gonna be okay because obviously it shows at the end that Elliot everything's gonna be okay like Elliot's gonna be fine the brother is more of a protector now it's he's he's got a different outlook on how he should be with his sister and his mom is gonna start being a little bit more uh, present. Even though she is present, but only being a little bit more uh, open to her kids, and yeah, yeah, that is our conversation on ET, man. So we <laughs> we've reached the end, man, and uh, we're gonna get into the hot seat right now. But yeah, uh, let's go. Thanks, man, for choosing this movie. I I, f- I forgot how much I love this movie, and I'm glad that you chose. Well, you I chose this one for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I could get you to uh, watch it again. I'm glad uh, you enjoyed it. <laughs> yep. Uh, if only we had an alien that liked to eat Reese's Pieces and get drunk during the day, right? You know, uh, life would be a lot easier. Actually, they have some, have some Reese's Pieces in the house right now, actually. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, we're here at the end, my friend, and we do a little nice little segment here that we like, that we do with everybody. So, uh, here we go. We have to, you have to recommend one movie that people watch, and you also have to call dibs on a movie for season two. So, All right. Wesley... Let them out. Let them out, man. Bring them out. Bring them out. <laughs> All right. I've been thinking about it. So my recommendation for everybody to watch is, uh, I don't know if you've seen this movie. You may have, but the Taika, Taika Waititi film called Boy. Have you seen that movie? Nope. Oh, man. Oh, man. I had not seen it either until like a week or two ago. It came out in 2010, and it's one of Taika Waititi's first films. And he's he directs it and he's uh, a stars in it. It's on Amazon Prime right now, so it's easy to find, easy to watch. All right. And ironically enough, tons of ET references throughout the whole thing. It literally starts with an ET quote on the screen, and it's insane. It's set in the '80s, so he's constantly like referencing ET and things like that. But it's also just like a good coming of age story as well. Yeah. It's about kind of like how we see our fathers. It's like, it's, I don't want to get too much into it, but 
it's almost like it's a lot similar to E.T., but it's also kind of different. It's like he has his father in his life for the first time, and uh, the way he's per, see, the way he sees him is not really the way that he is, and it's kind of about coming to terms with that, about kind of having a deadbeat dad. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess you would say, and Taika Waititi plays the dad. It's hilarious, but it's also like really sad and heartbreaking at times. I don't know. It's a great like coming of age movie, and if you like movies like E.T., then you'll probably be all about it because it's it's great. So that's that's my recommendation. It's on Amazon Prime right now, so it's easy to find. All right, man. So that's it, uh, boys. Uh, go, boy, go and uh, go and watch that. That's Wesley's recommendation, and now. We get into the one that I'm always looking forward to. What are you going to steal from everybody else for season two of the Cinema Condition? I'm gonna I'm gonna go another normie pick. I think. <laughs> I, uh, Do what you want, man. I uh, I always keep this as my ET is my first favorite movie, and my second favorite that I want to talk about next time is Edward Scissorhands. All right, nobody has claimed that, man. Wow, that's cool. Uh, by the way, I, before I before we do claimings, like I should probably send an updated list of what's claimed, so people don't, so I don't give them the awkward. Uh, yeah, that's kind of hard. That's true. I, that would have been bad if I was like, oh, um, well, uh, let me pick something else. That's another movie where suburbia is kind of shown off to be like very like, different, I like was, nosy I was, and ugly. I had that in my had that in my back pocket when you were talking about that. I was like, ooh. He's going to love this pick then because yeah. that's it's kind of a Tim Burton trademark where suburbia is always kind of portrayed as like the villain almost. <laughs> like, Yeah, kind of like really nosy people. And yeah, I, I, I love Edward Scissorhands. I haven't seen it in a really long time, but that's going to be your pick for uh, season two of The Cinema Condition. And nobody yeah, else can play that. It's been a while that. since I've uh, been a while since I've watched it as well. So I'm excited to revisit that one. Yep. Yep. So thank you so much for coming on, man. Uh, this is now we've reached the end and you can plug all your stuff. You got a new video out and everything, man. Uh, I don't even know if I told you what I'm working on right now. I don't know if it'll be up by the time this episode, this will be uh, up next Wednesday. Okay. So it may or may not be, I'm working on it right now. I'm editing it. But if you go on my YouTube channel called viewist, uh, You'll see our episodes of the the series we've done before, Nostalgia. But I'm starting a new thing, or I'm attempting to, where I interview different people. And I just interviewed uh, a week ago. I interviewed D. Wallace, who plays Mary in E.T. And uh, I was able to talk to her for like 40 minutes. And I'm chopping it up now and editing a video. But it was... <laughs> crazy conversation especially for me because i'm obviously obsessed with et so just getting to sit down and talk to her for a while was awesome and she uh she shared some fun stuff and uh that should be up on our youtube channel uh next week at some point so or well this week if you're listening <laughs> yeah listening now so it's uh it's a fun one and i'm hoping to interview some more people soon so definitely check that out it's uh it's going to be a long one, but it's uh, if you're into E.T. and into just uh, hearing more about it, hearing from somebody who was there, like it's it was pretty fascinating for me. So I'm, I'm very excited to share that with people. Dude, that is awesome that you got to interview, to interview her. That's amazing. I can't believe she said yes. <laughs> I'm still like kind of shocked. The, just the fact that she like agreed to it, I was like, I was on cloud nine, so that it was really cool. Yeah, that's really awesome. I hope everybody checks that out when it's up, and uh, uh, you know, Instagram, Twitter, go ahead and plug it up, bro. Oh yeah, I'm uh, Wesley Bout on uh, Twitter, and uh, on Instagram, I'm Wesley underscore collects, and uh, that's where I post all my toys, plenty of ET stuff. Plenty of other like uh, Funko Pops, action figures, whatever. All my toy photography stuff. Yeah, 
And you can always find uh, Wesley around here on the on the Nerdcore Podcast uh, Network on shows that we are constantly doing. He's always on. He's he's always here for the Oscars stuff, and that's awesome. We, we love when he comes on. So uh, go go and show some love to Wesley and find him where he's telling you to go find him. All right. Well, it seems that Wesley cut out, but we'll go ahead and finish it up here. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll catch you on the next one, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>